What I responded to was the idea that somehow Halloween 2 could follow a moment later. So it would feel when you saw the film that it, it was a continuation of Halloween. What's the boogeyman? As a matter of fact, it was. Quite frankly, I was surprised that Halloween 2 came out as well as it did and that it enjoyed the success that it did. I thought it was sensational. I said, man, what are they doing a sequel for? You ain't gonna get better than that one. And I'm prejudiced, but I thought it was better. What's going on out here? Call the police. Tell the sheriff I shot him. I am so surprised at the cult following of Halloween 2. And it is the gift that keeps on getting. I've been trick or treated to death tonight. You don't know what death is. The idea to make another Halloween occurred to me <laughs> after the first receipts rolled in. I thought to myself that uh, I wanted to make another movie with John Carpenter and it seemed like the logical thing to do. It, it really wasn't something that I had worked out in my head, but the, uh, the seeds for it were, came pretty quick after the initial success. When the concept of Halloween 2 came along, nobody that I recall on, on the team was all that excited about the idea. We felt like we'd really done it with Halloween. That was a, an original and we left it all out there on the court, so to speak. I talked to John Carpenter about it, but he had another idea. He wanted to do a, 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 another picture as his follow-up. I guess he felt that Halloween 1 was a fluke, or if not that, I think he felt that he didn't want to repeat himself, and I respected him for that. He wanted to do a picture called The Fog. And I said, sure, let's do Fog. We'll do Fog first. Then we'll talk about Halloween too. And we agreed to do that. You've got to remember this was an era where the sequel was still a concept. It wasn't an everyday, an everyday thing. I had to be in Cannes for the film festival, so I left for Cannes. And uh, during the plane ride, I happened to be sitting next to Bob Ramey, who was an old friend of mine from Paramount days. Bob was now head of uh, a company called Avco Embassy. And they kind of made low budget pictures, but a bit uh, cut above. They spent a little bit more money in. If you want to know more about John Carpenter, and I said, yeah, we're going to do another movie with John Carpenter. We're going to do two more movies with him. We're going to do The Fog, and then we're going to do uh, Halloween 2. Not long after, Bob Ramey at Embassy announced that he was going to do The Fog with John Carpenter. I was pretty upset. I was livid. I called Carpenter and I got nowhere with him. And I did the only thing I could at that point. I sued them both. To settle the case, we agreed to let Carpenter do the fog uh, with Embassy. And we got the commitment for Halloween 2. Deborah Hill and John, as, as they did in, in Halloween 1, were the total creative forces behind Halloween 2. So it was sort of underwhelming and like, well, I don't know what do you want to do. But it was evident that the the powers that be who were in a position to do so were gonna do it. That train was gonna leave the station. I was kind of the logical person to point to for the directing gig, and I was thrilled. It was just, yes, of course, that's a great opportunity, can't wait. Uh, so you can imagine my dismay when the script came back to me and I read it and I just hated it. I personally uh, was not too pleased with the script when I got it. It was pedestrian. It was predictable. It was a professional script. I just felt that they were abandoning the essence of the character. That's Strode Girl. That's Michael Myers' sister. It 
felt like everything that Halloween was not. Uh, sort of the antithesis, where Halloween got it done with suggestion and shadows and true old school suspense technique. Somehow to me, Halloween 2 was summed up with that like hypodermic in the eyeball. It was just like, eh, ah, come on. The theater of the mind to me has always been something I really, I really love and, I, and I've used it. Halloween 1 was born of that idea and, and my instructions to Carpenter has been reported many, many times is, was I don't want anyone to see any gore or violence or blood in the movie. Keep it to a minimum. I want it to be theater of the mind. I want people to supply the visual images and Carpenter understood that perfectly and therein lies the success of Halloween. John's thinking on the matter was very clear and simple. You can't argue with the fact that since Halloween got made and all these imitators, Friday the 13th and all the others came along, horror movies had changed. There was inflation involved in terms of violence and gore and what you saw on screen to the point at which John felt like he was in a box. He could not do the same thing that Halloween had been doing, but I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it and, and really do the, the good job that would be expected with deep sincerity. So I felt horrible, but I, uh, I withdrew from the project and I felt doubly horrible because it was my friends, my, my crew, my, my pals. I came out of the AFI with a short film and uh, it looked like everything was gonna break and then I ended up having the same agent as John Carpenter. And part of the big selling point for me uh, that this agent gave me was, look, I represent John, he's, he's, his career's taken off because of Halloween, and uh, a lot of people are offering him movies, and he's not gonna be able to do everything that is offered, and, and I'm gonna do the classic bait and switch. I'm gonna say, well, uh, John's not available, but I have this young director. Well, little did we know that three or four months later, he called me up one day and he said, hey, what about Halloween 2? That was uh, John Carpenter's choice, approved by Dino De Laurentiis. I met with Rick and just, my approval wasn't needed, but they were very courteous and asked me to meet with him. Uh, I found him to be a, a pretty good filmmaker and a, and a guy who really seemed to know his business. And as far as I'm concerned, he did a journeyman job. John and Deborah and I sat down and, and we sort of talked a little bit about the script. And, you know, I think from the very beginning, um, what they wanted and what I responded to was the idea that somehow Halloween 2 could follow a moment later. So it would feel when you saw the film that it, it was a continuation of Halloween. And so that was the overriding goal, I think, was to, uh, if you liked Halloween, you're going to like Halloween too, because it's really a continuation. So stylistically, and in terms of the story development and all of those things, it wanted to feel very much like the continuation. I had actually just gone and met um, this other uh, kind of youngish guy who uh, uh, was producing a movie. Um, and he, even though he had directed some, he, he was producing this movie. Um, his name was Steven Spielberg. It was Poltergeist. So when I called my agent to say I'd met with this Steven Spielberg guy, um, David, my agent, said, oh, well, okay. Uh, there's a conflict. Uh, there's Halloween 2. And I said, what's that? I hadn't heard about it. He said, oh, yeah. Uh, they want to make a sequel. I felt a certain... Um, you know, kind of obligation because, you know, John and Deborah had um, given me such a great opportunity. So I, uh, I decided that, uh, that integrity was the better part of valor. And uh, so I agreed to do Halloween too. My first goal was to make it feel as much like the first one as possible, which meant very similar lighting and camera movement. And I, you know, I really had watched that film a bunch of times and, and there was a very fluid camera and it was the early days of Steadicam, which was in those days called the Panaglide. We knew we were going to be shooting, you know, the majority of the film in a hospital setting. Working in a real hospital was you know, sort of out of the question. So we needed to find a location that looked like a hospital. The production designer began looking around and found 
what was essentially a unused little hospital in Pasadena. That turned out to be the most difficult location because when we scouted it, I was very aware of the proximity of the airport. It seemed like there was a plane every 12 minutes. And I said to the location guy, you know, what's the deal here? Uh, I'm hearing a plane every 12 minutes. And he said, no, 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 that's the bad weather pattern. It, you know, it's much better than that. Well, it turned out that was a good weather pattern. And the bad weather pattern, the planes would be stacked up. And sometimes you would go for 15 minutes without a break. They would just fly in one after another. And we had actually, at some point, we had to put somebody on the roof to be able to walkie-talkie us in when there was a gap just long enough to try to get a scene in. And it was really hard on the actors because they just get into a scene and then this big symphony sound. Rick didn't want a brightly lit hospital hallway because there's nothing scary about that. So it was a great experience to work in a location and try to find out ways to create the mood and style. Where's Dr. Mason? Uh, he's been at the country club. I think he's drunk. Oh, great. What have we got? Stab wound, left anterior chest, possibly penetrating, multiple Slow contusions. Stroke. Yeah, yeah, yeah so come on, let's go. Fracture right ankle. When I got hired to do Halloween II, I was studying acting, uh, not to be an actor, but because it was the area I didn't really know a lot about. In my class, you know, it was a very interesting class. I, it, Tom Selleck was in it and before anyone knew who he was, and Ted Danson and Michelle Pfeiffer. For me, directing my first film, I wanted to feel as much within my comfort zone, and one of the ways to do that was to work with people I knew. So when you look at this cast, there are a lot of people that I worked with. The opportunity came in that classroom because Leo, who was one of the actors, Gloria, Nancy, we were all in this class. And Rick just, you know, took us on and said, let's do a film together. So it's, you know, it's being in the right place. It's really working the craft as much as you can. Now, you have to remember in those days that this type of movie was just kind of new and it didn't have a lot of cachet at the time. So it was sort of like, oh, a B movie. My agent said, you might not want to do it if you get it. <gasps> Sorry. We worked pretty long hours. I mean, that movie was shot like a real movie. There was none of this, like, okay, two takes, we're moving on, two takes, we're moving on. There was just really the desire to make something together, to work as a team. We were all just really grateful to be on this set and to be doing this film because we all had seen the first one. On Halloween 1, Jamie Lee Curtis was relatively new, and with the success of Halloween 1 and the character that she created, it was obvious that she was going to be called back. To, to Jamie's credit, she embraced the role of Scream Queen. She will tell you herself how proud she is of Halloween 1, and uh, it didn't take much convincing to get, to get Jamie Lee to, uh, to do it, I th and I think she's proud of her work, and, she, and rightly so. She always is a real, you know, extroverted, big personality and real, real trooper, you know, and she had to do a lot of, you know, tiring stuff. She has to wear a hospital gown through this entire movie, and she has to do a lot of physical stuff. In fact, I think she has to crawl around on her hands and knees quite a bit in this movie. Hospital gowns, as we all know, are notoriously short and they open down the back. And I just remember that being a particular challenge. She had like circa early 80s and short hair, and so she wore this wig and she was always like pissed off at the wig. I played on a softball team here, the Showbiz League, and it was Rob Reiner, Billy Crystal, um, Bruno Kirby, God rest his soul, and um, uh, Chris Guest. And she would come and, uh, and that's where they met. And the rest, as they say, is Hollywood history. He was my patient for 15 years. He became an obsession with me until I realized that there was nothing within him, neither conscience nor reason, that wasn't even remotely human. John originally wanted to use Christopher Lee for Halloween 1. And I can understand why he might have th thought that way, but it was a very unoriginal idea. As I explained to John, if you do it that way, you got a Christopher Lee movie, horror movie. Uh, it's a hammer movie. I had seen a movie called Will Penny. It was a Western starring Charlton Heston, but the role of the villain in that piece was played by Donald Pleasant. He played a maniacal father, 
and his crazy, wild-eyed performance so impressed me. It stuck with me for years. And, and I said to John, John, why don't we try Donald Pleasance? And he said, you know, that's not a bad idea. And he liked it. He, and he called Donald Pleasance, and Donald Pleasance accepted. And the reason he accepted was because he had, he had seen Assault on Precinct 13, and his daughter was so impressed with John Carpenter that she said, Dad, you got to do this. You know, throughout your career, you meet people and you work with them and you say, man, I had to, like I worked with Spielberg and Jim Cameron and so on, and I got to work with those people. He's one of them. He, he's one of the people that was really a treat to be with. He took it seriously. He wasn't working on something below his skills. Once again, he was a uh, true professional and um, very uh, inspiring. He's just an incredible character, and I, uh, we had a, quite a few serious scenes, particularly in, in Halloween 2, with a lot of exposition. And he was someone that would get into character instantly, but the minute he was out or the minute they were reloading film, he would have a joke, he would have some oddball remark. I mean, he was pretty eccentric. He didn't hang around and sit in the chair and, and rap with the guys. He, he was he, in the dressing room doing his lines, and when he walked on the set, he knew your part, his part, and you better get it right. He knew that this little role had suddenly gave him new legions of moviegoers as followers, and so he was easy. He was key, by the way. In my opinion, he was the glue that made the sequels possible. Marion Chambers with Dr. Loomis at the clinic. He's here. Uh, 10 4, unit calling, identify suspect. Michael Myers, just get your ass over here. John Carpenter and Deborah tended to use people over again. They'd like to have a little bit of a company. And I thought I would probably be in Halloween too because there were very few of us that um, survived Halloween 1. Marion Chambers was just an iconic character because she was this smoking nurse. And that's what everybody loved about her. So I was written into the second one. It was fun that she was a sort of under protective co <laughs> coverage and, and nobody knew her identity, but Michael Myers found her. I met John Carpenter uh, on Escape from New York. He and Deborah Hill, they produced that film. And again, I was doubling Kurt Russell and that was the reason that I was pushed onto them. When Escape finished, John went on preparing something else. It might have been the thing, I'm not sure. But Deborah went to do Halloween 2. And she called me up and said, would, would you like the job as a stunt coordinator? We'd love to have you. So I said, yeah. She said, well, you got to come in and meet the director. Well, that was OK. I was used to that anyway. So I went in and, and talked to her. And she said, uh, go down and meet Rick. He's not at the end of the hall, Rick Rosenthal. So I started down this hallway. and stopped and I looked in this office and there was just a desk, a chair, and this mask laying on the desk. Hmm. So I went in and got the thing and I put it on and I walked to Rick Rosenthal's do doorway and I just stood there and looked at him. And he said, who are you? I didn't answer. He said, who the hell are you? And I kind of chuckled. I took the mask off and said, hi, I'm Dick Warlock. I'm here for the job of so-and-so. Well, come here and sit down. So I went over and sat down and we had our little meeting. I got up to leave and I had the mask in my hand. I turned back to him and I said, is there any reason I can't play this guy? He kind of looked me up and down and he said, if Deborah doesn't care, I don't care. So that's how I got the job. And we just hit it off and he, he, there was something about the way he moved that he glided as Michael Myers. Now I hadn't seen the first Halloween when I got the job for the two. Uh, knew a little bit about the character because of what Deborah had said. So I thought, well, I better watch this. So I watched this and I really, in all honesty, with all due respect to, to the guys that, that did it, and, and I understand there were five different people did it in the first movie. So with, with all due respect to Nick Castle, I, I couldn't put it together, what the character should be like. It seemed like when I put the mask on, I went, I would breathe underneath there. I felt it. I really felt it when I put it on and did it. Rick let me just do what I wanted to do. He would tell me, you know, you're going from point A to point B, and that, but he never told me how to do it. And, and I understand that I got knocked by Deborah on one of the anniversary editions for never getting the walk down. Well, she was on the set every day and never 
said a word to me about, I think you're walking too slow or you should do this or that. And it's the same thing with Rick. Rick never said, hey, a little faster, a little more energy, a little this. And so I thought, well, they like what I'm doing. The most inhibiting thing for me was being the stunt coordinator responsible for the actors and actresses and their safety. And how far was I going to go to please Rick as far as the violent aspect? Well, without Dick Warlock, it's nothing because he's the man behind the death scene. And he would take care of you, you know, and I think that's what you learn to find in a stuntman, to look for in a stuntman. Because as an actor, he's your link to, to safety. I know that you don't know me very well, but I just want to let you know that I'm not going to let anything happen to you. It was my first feature film. And, I, you know, I was like loaded with energy. I was like, you know, I thought every every take you had to like blast it out 100 percent, and because that's what you do on stage. You know, you you get it all fired up. I used to run out of frame all the time. I'd be like, you know, you'd be like, Lance, you, you want to be in the movie? You got to stay in frame, because I was sort of sort of trained as a theater actor, and I was always darting around the stage, and and so I thought it was the same deal. I sort of tried to apply everything I I learned from theater acting and, and film, and it's like, no, keep that guy in frame. Lance Guest. We all knew that he was the star of the film, and uh, he was incredibly handsome, uh, incredibly charming, and actually very talented. I liked the flirtation between him and Jamie. I just thought he added a really sweet element to the movie. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm 20 years old. I'm surrounded by all these, like, really beautiful women. <laughs> so, I, I, you know, I, it was not lost on me. Look, Jimmy, rule number one, never get involved with a patient. Nurses, that's another story. Bud was a guy that he was skating through life, you know. I mean, he'd smoke his weed, he'd smoke, you know, this and that. Ladies' man, or at least he fancied himself as one. Um, he didn't do bad with Pablo Shoop, though. First things first, Deborah Hill, God rest her soul, she did not want me in that role no matter what. And her valid point in her mind was this takes place in middle America. Leo Rossi is an East Coast guy. His rhythms are East Coast. And it was like, oh, man. I, I mean, I, I'm not, not going to get this. And Rick said, just be patient. Be patient. And he never let up. He never let up. And in the end, he wore her down. And I got the role. We had a song that he wanted me to sing. And the, so the producer was there. He said, well, you can't have a song. You can't just pick a song. We'll have to pay the rights. And, you know, they were conscious of the budget. And we said, well, she said, all right, pick one that's public domain. And it was, happy birthday? No, that's not going to work. Happy birthday. And then somebody said, you know, um, Amazing Grace is public domain. They said, is it? Yeah. Well, he says, well, sing, sing Amazing Grace like, uh, like Bud would sing it. He said, you sure you want that? And he says, yeah. Amazing Grace, come sit on my face. Don't make me cry, I need your pie. I've been to signings, you know, throughout the country, and they all want me, go ahead, sing it, sing it, sing it. Leo Rossi, ah, he's the greatest. And he has grown into the most hilarious gangstery guy you ever want to meet. Leo, oh my God, Leo. Leo was in my acting class, and I thought he was really hot. And when I saw him in the film, um, I got to see him naked, and he was just amazing. Did not disappoint any of us. I signed to do the nude scene. And the girl, Pamela Choup, signed to do the nude scene because they needed it for foreign. And you know, the whole crew, they got that date circled, right? Her death scene was talked about, you know, even before it happened. That was a very important death scene. It had to be done right, and there was a lot of emphasis put on it. Well, we get there the day, and Pamela announces it was about 7 in the morning. I'm not doing it nude. I can't. I can't. They called her manager or agent, and it got real, like, tense. And everybody, and I'm sitting there with, you know, my robe and my little Speedo on. And Rick says, um, Leo, look, I think if you get in there, you'll break the ice. She's coming around. It'll be okay. I said, okay, I sign, you know. So I take the robe off. I still have the Speedo. And I get one toe into the tub, and I go, oh, oh, I said, Rick, it's freezing. And he looked at me and said, Leo, I'm in a jam, the generator broke, you gotta help me. And I looked at his eyes, and I went, this is the guy that went to bat for me. 
I said, okay. So I get in, I take the paints. I look down, it was a raisin. You talk about the Italian stallion, forget about it. And of course she got loosened up and went in and uh, we did the scene, but that's ice water team. Ah, uh, boy, you want to do nude scenes? You want romance? Uh-huh. Okay, you got it. The, the hot tub scene was probably my favorite. And it wasn't because of the obvious reasons, right? Because I never saw those obvious, obvious reasons until the movie came out. What Dick had said, it, this is how it was choreographed. He said, when I grab you, right, arch your shoulders back. You know, keep them back. I'll give tug one, tug two, tug three, as far as you can stretch them back, and then tug four. Let yourself just go completely loose. I'll cushion your fall as you go down. Top-notch stuntman, he was a stunt coordinator. He did it perfectly. Pamela Susan Shoup, I had to dunk her into the water, right? So I just talked to her, I said, what I'm gonna do, sweetheart, is I'm gonna put my hand on the back of your head, and when you're ready, I'll just apply a little pressure. When you're ready, we go down. When you're ready to come back up, you apply the pressure and I bring you back up. And she was very happy with that. And so those are the things that I was concerned about as much as playing the character. Dr. Mixter, it's an emergency. My uh, most vivid memory of shooting is that we were shooting my death scene where I get the needle in the eye that was one of my favorites, the way he, Rick had me come out of the darkness. I, I liked that. I thought that was really eerie. That was a little different from anything else that had been done in the first one. It had a, a moment of, of kind of, and you could feel the audience uh, in that moment of su tension and suspense sort of go for it. And I'm very much of a method actress. So I really, really wanted to just collapse, you know, after the needle went in my eye. It was very important that I just collapse, like, you know, be completely dead at that moment. So we began to shoot the scene, and I'm shooting the scene, and I get really into it, and he, you know, he puts this needle in my eye, and I collapse, and I hit the corner of the desk full on because somebody accidentally had forgotten to move the desk. So my eye is cut wide open, I'm totally bleeding, and I'm yelling, use it, use it, use it. And poor Rick goes, cut, we can't use it. And I'm fighting him to use it because it was real blood, it was real gore. And so they ended up taking me to emergency room and I have 11 stitches or nine stitches in my eye. The cafeteria scene was shot after my death scene, so I already was scarred and puffy. <laughs> so we had to just shoot it in an angle with a bunch of makeup on one side of my face. One of the sequences I thought was a, a little different is when Gloria Gifford, as a nurse, is discovered on the operating table. The way they did that scene was funny because they first uh, created a pool, an actual pool, which was about you know eight foot by eight foot, a bunch of like two by six and they put some plastic down, and then they just poured all this red liquid, and it was like basically a red swimming pool. It was like what they would have done if this was, you know, a biblical epic, and you know, you turn, the sea runs with blood. But we realized there's, I don't know, 50 gallons worth of water, and nobody has 50 gallons of blood inside them, you know? So at one point, I think it was Rick, it was like, wait a minute, this, this could not come out of a person's body. And so it was like, the guys have been, you know, building it all day long, and they're like, they scrapped it, so we lost the whole day, and they just poured a bunch of blood on the floor, and they had a, a sort of a fake floor for me to hit. I spent a lot of time getting blood out of my hair. That was, you know. My death scene. Uh, they had me in the Mary Poppins harness, the actual one with the wires. And uh, it's painful because they press against you. Very bruised, very bruised. Then when we were done, Dick came up to me and he said, I'm going to bump your pay. You're getting stunt pay today. I thought, huh? I did invent one thing in Halloween to a joke. And I said to Rick, I'm going to put her in white hospital clogs. And when she dies, her shoes hit the floor. And I was like, yes. The scene in the movie where I'm slashing, I hate that. But I've had fans come out, that's my favorite scene. I don't understand that, but anyway. The fire scene at the end, we did that two times. We sit up 
the, the interior of the hallway, having a roof on it made it extremely dangerous because the fire had nowhere to go and it, it went to the ceiling and rolled out. We set up multiple cameras uh, and then cleared out the stage completely. We were told to stay outside during this particular fire walk, which was one of the final stunts in the whole thing. And so we didn't witness what happened, but the stage door is gigantic. It's like a, like a five car garage, if not more, and it's very heavy. And we were out there. And then when it blew, uh, it was larger than we had even thought. It moved the big, huge, giant loading door. The entire door just went whoosh, whoosh, like that. And we're like, what happened? And then, you know, we found out later that there's a bit too much fire in the fire walk. And I came through the fire. And when I came through, it ignited me. Well, by this time, the flames are boiling and going down the hallway. I burned my arms right here. Because the suit I was wearing, which they don't have anymore, had zippers. Well, he transferred right through there and just burned my arms, but not severely. He just put a little stab on it and we did it again. So we had to do that scene twice. And at that time, the, the, the other stunt guys in the community said that was one of the hottest burns you'll, you'll see. Very effective and uh, also a great sort of uh, visual climax to the film. Deborah told me we're not going to do that thing anymore because I asked, I said, can I have the mask? She said, yeah, we're never going to do another movie with him. So I grabbed the mask, I got the coveralls, the scalpel, the Elrod knife, the boots, and off I went. I have been a big fan of, of Carrie. I thought the ending, particularly this sort of one last, in that case, literally from the grave. Uh, but I liked, I liked the idea of when you think the movie's over, it's not. And, and um, we had come up with this idea in which you think Jamie Lee is safe and she's going off in the ambulance and nothing can touch her. And, we're 100% we're sure Michael Myers is dead and because we've seen him burned to death. And, uh, but it'd be nice if there were one more twist. So we came up with this idea that, that uh, Lance would sit up and in that first moment, all you would see was the sheet and there'd be a, just that one last little, oh. They didn't really want to kill me off and they wanted to maybe spin off some other thing if you know, Jamie was going to do more movies. Um, so I think they just didn't want to kill me off. So I, as far as I was concerned, <clears throat> you know, I lived and everything's going to be fine. You know, I just got a bump on the head. Nobody said anything to me. I never knew until I saw the film that uh, that had been, had been cut. Oh, no me. Oh, okay. Does that mean, I didn't even think that I died. I never even occurred to me that I died. I was like, oh, well, they just cut that part out, but I'm still alive. And, and to this day, I don't know. You know, who made that decision? Was it a studio decision, uh, a John decision, a Deborah decision, a uh, universal decision, a foreign decision, a Mustafa decision, a uh, Dino decision? I think it was proper to sort of give her the last thing all by herself and, you know, make it about her. It's not about me, it's about her. So I think that was, I think it was proper. I think it was the right, the right way to go. Well, Halloween 2 had a lot of cooks, a lot of chefs. Um, I was hired to direct it, but we also had a director before me, John Carpenter, who had, you know, because this felt like a continuation in many ways, he had a very strong opinion. And then um, Mustafa was the producer of record, but, you know, De Laurentiis was also the financier and also a producer. And, and there were times where uh, they wouldn't agree on things. And so, Sometimes I was uh, like thrown out there, well, you show it to Dino, but don't forget there's certain things we really like that he isn't gonna like. And so I'll never forget when Dino saw it, early on there's a scene where a kid shows up outside the emergency room with his mom and he's got a razor blade in the roof of his mouth and Dino hated that. And I knew that John and Deborah really liked that. And Dino was like, you know, oh, that's terrible. We need to take that out. And I was like, well, okay, but, um, you know, I think John and Deborah really like this. And so there's a little bit of that. Mark Goldblatt cut the majority of the picture. They called me to cut a TV version of Halloween 1. And I was in the next cutting room from where Mark and Rick Rosenthal were working. Deborah and John weren't happy with the director's cut. 
and they asked me if I would come in. They wanted fresh eyes on the picture. They asked me if I would come in and um, work on it with John over the weekend. And John and I went through the picture and cut um, about 14 minutes out of it. And, and John knew that he was going to write new scenes for the picture and um, he wanted me to cut them. So there were a couple of uh, additional scenes that were shot later on that were not in the uh, original script that sort of raised the stakes and up the ante and, and up the body count. John showed up on the set and Rick wasn't there and I thought, well, well, what's going on? And the reason that they did that is that nowhere in the movie did it explain how Michael knew that Laurie Strode had been taken to the hospital. So he comes out and he's laying out a shot where this child is supposed to walk down the road with the radio on explaining where Laurie had been taken. And he bumps into Michael Myers and then Michael heads off to the hospital. Then he shot, I think, the burning mask at the end and there was another kill that I made, which didn't never made sense to me, but I walk across the neighbor's yard right after the opening, and this gal's talking on a telephone, and I hide in her house and cut her throat. The, the style of the film evolved into a little bit more classically what, what's known today as a slasher movie. There was a bit more violence, but I thought it was rather well controlled, and by today's standards, quite tepid anyway. So I would say that, yes, they did jack it up a little bit, but nothing, nothing seriously did different from, from the initial concept. I, I, I liked the picture, and I liked what John came up with to add into the picture. I think the scenes that John wrote amplified some character stuff, and we moved the picture along. It was pretty lean. You know, I think whenever a director directs a film, there, there are always factors. Um, filmmaking is not a pure art, it's a collaborative art. And, uh, you know, if you want to paint, you paint. If you want to sculpt, you sculpt. And those are single person decision making arts. But filmmaking is a, very much a, a group effort, a collective. And so, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a sense of this auteurship, you know, that uh, the director is the author of the film. And I think that's true when it's a personal story and it's autobiographical and uh, the director's written the script and all of that. But, you know, there are times also when you're hired and you're hired to do a certain kind of job. Halloween series became electronic because the attractiveness was we needed no one else. That was just one or two guys in a room did the whole thing. There's no arrangers, there's no copyists, there's no scoring dates, there's no deadlines that we're going to spend $50,000 tomorrow in orchestra, we better be ready for 100 piece, etc. At the same time, John Carpenter in his minimalist score didn't require an orchestra. So what he was looking for in a person to work with is one, somebody who had all the technology wired because he never wanted to know about the technology. In fact, a couple times I tried to explain stuff to him, he goes, I don't even want to know. That's your job. You know, make sure it's in tune, make sure the technology's there, make sure it's wired properly, make sure when you push record, it really gets recorded. Done. Technically, I re received the 24, at the time, a 16 track of John's original score that he did with a fellow named Dan Wyman over at Sound Arts. And so now I transfer that to a 24 track, got some open tracks, and basically I overdubbed me over John. So John was still there on tape, and then my overdubs is what, what shaped the sound of Halloween too. Well, certainly the, the Halloween theme, the upgrade that I did with the overdubs, uh, brought it to this, this darker, gothic texture. And then of course I added rhythm, because the original one didn't have rhythms, and I actually gave it a beat and also running in parallel to the Halloween 2, I was doing Star Trek 2 at the same time. So I had, I had Star Trek in the morning and Halloween in the afternoon kind of thing. And uh, I was left alone because Carpenter was busy creating the thing and my assignment was to just pick up where he left off and modernize it, bring it up to date, beef it up a little bit and give it back to them so they could put it back in Halloween 2.
The first time we saw the film done was at Universal and it was a screening and um, I had my parents come up, it was my first movie, and really what I remember the most, <laughs> this is terrible, I said, Daddy, did you like it? And he said, hmm, a little stiff. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, the film was, uh, was pretty much Pavlovian, they, they tried to, uh, <laughs> they tried to get the same emotions uh, in, in the formulaic way that Halloween 1 did. The difference is that Halloween 1 was original and it was innovative and creative and Halloween 2 was by its very nature imitative and pedestrian. The connection between Halloween 1 and all the sequels in my opinion is, uh, is invalid. I look at Halloween 2 and, and say it, it was a great extension of the first one. Although of course it did you know, have its own sort of standalone suspense. To me, the sequels always had a bad name, so I kind of expected it to be, like, not as good as the first one. But a lot of people really, you know, they think it's, they think it's good enough, and, it's, and it's, it has the same kind of kick. Halloween one is the iconic one, but also it was close enough to the Halloween one to be a valid sequel. Halloween two plays beautifully and there were just wonderful, iconic scenes in it. I thought it was sensational. I said, man, what are they doing a sequel for? You ain't gonna get better than that one. And I'm prejudiced, but I thought it was better. I thought it had more gooses. Ooh, well, you know, and all that. You know, it, it, I had mixed feelings because the only thing I felt, other than I thought that everyone did a really, really good job, is something inside of me felt like a certain responsibility to the 11 and 12 year olds that were going to go see it. It'll be okay. We'll play some games tonight. And... And when I went to my first convention and I saw hundreds of people going around and saying, can I have your autograph, Mr. Warlock? I, I, I mean, I was shocked. And I still am. I'm so surprised at the cult following of Halloween 2. And it is the gift that keeps on getting. Um, it wasn't an initial response. It really took about 20 years to coalesce. Suddenly with um, the internet, it sort of, I think, gave a meeting place for a lot of people who were, I guess, harboring a lot of cultish feelings around Halloween too, and the rest of them. It was kind of hard, quite frankly, to, to reproduce the, the, the magic of the first one. The first, the originality and the speciality of the first one was something that comes along every so often in movies. And, and you know, it was innovative and new and different. Quite frankly, I was surprised that Halloween 2 came out as well as it did and that it enjoyed the success that it did. These are not easy films to make because they're, they're, they're always factors. And maybe that's because the movie sort of lingers and goes on, the, the, the franchise continues.